have one last speaker, saving the best for last, um, which is not to say that everybody else wasn't best as well. <laughs> <laughs> it's all like children. Um, and I'd like to introduce you uh, to Dan O'Hara. Dan um, and I met a zillion years ago in Cologne, I think it was at that point. He's a professor of literature and some other things. And, um, and is currently in uh, Berlin, um, living in Berlin. And he's finished a book on, um, what's his name? Uh, J.G. Ballard. J. J. G. Ballard. Yeah. I was going to say Bachelard, I knew it was wrong. <laughs> uh, Ballard. It's a bit different. Yeah, a little bit different. <laughs> um, and welcome, Dan. Uh, thanks. Can I come yeah. On to also, also, I meant to say that he is um, going to be our visiting professor here uh, in January, and um, he's part of the Virtual Futures. Um, in fact, he is Virtual Futures. <laughs> the, the, the entire realm of things that's going on in October when we have the huge event that will be hosted um, at CIFAR in Birmingham. Oh, cool. Thank you. Uh, and thank you all. Um, <clears throat> I'll add a little bit to that, if I might. Um, I guess I, I get described most often as two things, a literary historian but also a philosopher of technology, because my work has always been split between these two realms. And I think, um, most interestingly uh, for you today, would be for me to come at this issue not as a literary historian, but as a philosopher of technology. And from the point of view of philosophy of technology, the question, what is a photograph, is uh, a very interesting one. Because we take the definition of technology to be uh, not gadgets like cameras and phones and things with batteries and computers and stuff. Technology is much like any other ology, like biology. It's a body of knowledge. It's a body of knowledge about techne, that is, how to do things. And the interesting uh, the interesting conclusion that we seem to have arrived at so far, when we ask Laruel's question, what is it that a photograph can do, uh, is that we don't know. So from the point of view of philosophy of technology, we're, we're kind of going around in circles here. Um, we've got this technological object, which is presumably um, an attempt to achieve an aim, uh, an exploitation of a body of knowledge which w with which we can then produce a result. But none of us any longer seems to know what result it is that we want to achieve with this technology. So I begin from a position of uh, rather confusing irony. Another irony this morning when I posted on Facebook that I would be talking today on the question what is a photograph was that um, a number of friends got back to me who are themselves photographers, commenting on this immediately, uh, including uh, James Goddard, um, the one-time bibliographer of J.G. <coughs> now a very fine photographer in his own right. And he said to me, hmm, <clears throat> well, it's a loaded question, isn't it? In what sense is what is a photograph a loaded question? Well, for Laruel, I guess it's a loaded question because of the is, because of the verb, because of the presumption, necessary or not, that there is an essence of a photograph, that it has an essential quality that makes it a photograph and nothing else, and that distinguishes it from all other things that are not photographs. Now, I have a problem with essences in general, uh, just as I have a problem with Heidegger, from whom all essences seem to come. And the problem with essences is that uh, they rather beg the question. Um, you can't really have a good historical account of how something came into being if you presume its being before you start to make that historical account. And this is one of the reasons Deleuze um, followed uh, his materialist philosophy, his materialist way of doing philosophy. 
And this is one of the reasons why he transformed the question of what things are into what can they do? How do they work? Can we define things by what they do and how they work? Is this a better way of asking the question, what is something, than presuming the essence of it? So, I'll leave that aside for a moment. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to engage in a sort of um, conversation with Ladderwell. Um, how many people have read the Ladderwell? Two. No, <laughs> Johnny? I have. Oh, okay. Oh, good. Yes. Um, I still disagree with the way you posit it is, but anyway. That's fine. That's fine. It doesn't have to always have an essence. Um, I'm going to be returning to one um, impressionistic theory of what a photograph might be uh, throughout what I say. And um, it doesn't matter if you go along with it now or not, or later or at all. I just want to say it at the beginning. Um, for me, it, I have this impression that there's something about a photograph that is a momentary blindness immediately preceding a kind of death. And I'll let that one sit there for a while because um, it's not going to make sense immediately. Laruel um, basically wants to try and find a space for photography in between the arts and the sciences. He wants to try and resolve this problem of who, who's claiming photography. Um, we've had, for example, Brendan saying that he's using photography as a scientist, but then we've also had people saying they're using photography as an art, and then we've had this statement about this banal, vast economy of the image in which people are using photography in ways in which they, whatever they're using it for, it's not art or science or anything. Um, Laruel wants to try and um, work out why <coughs> photography is not like artificial intelligence. And he says artificial intelligence is not a simulation of the world. Artificial intelligence is a simulation of a scientific technological description of the world, a technique that simulates. He says photography is not like this. I'm not so sure I'll come back to that in a minute. Another of the themes to which Laruel returns again and again in his thesis on non-photography is the issue of uh, the stance as something that particularly characterises photography. The stance, I presume he means, of the photographer. I'm reminded here of, um, if people have seen Man with a Movie Camera, Ziga Vertov's great film. Um, Ziga Vertov's stance behind the camera is, is wonderful. It's, it's, it's actually this, with the movie camera there. It's very stylized, very mannered. But there is, of course, a photographic stance which the body ad adopts in order to take a photograph. Stillness, posturing. There is also a stance of the photographed at the same time. People pose for photographs. They also compose themselves. Who escapes this? Does anything escape this? Perhaps only the dead escape this. Only the dead escape the stance of being photographed. What this makes me realize is that um, in a Foucauldian manner, the very act of photographing or being photographed is um, as much a disciplining of the body as any military or schooling or other institutional activity. It frames us as much as we frame when we photograph. 
That's another thing that Laruelle says in order to try and define an ontology of the photograph, a study of what the photograph is, a logic of what the photograph is. There's this word that he uses repeatedly, flattening. He says that photographs flatten. In what sense do photographs flatten, and what do they flatten? Let me read just a very short extract from the book. <coughs> On one hand, a photo makes everything it represents exist on a strictly equal footing. Form and ground, recto and verso, past and future, foreground and horizon, etc. All this now exists fully outside any ontological hierarchy. It is a flattening, a horizontality without horizon. He also calls photography blind. And he uses these two words elsewhere, blindness and flattening, not just in connection with photography, but also in connection with science. Uh, he's meaning the European tradition of the natural sciences. The tradition, the post-enlightenment tradition of measuring, perhaps, of quantifying of flattening the world into measurable elements. Now, of course, we all recognize this in photography every day, in one of its affordances, not an artistic affordance, not a, uh, a historical documentation affordance, but in the affordance uh, currently used by uh, the American and the British states, um, that is the photographic ID the photograph that is um, an index of measurements. It's a metric statement linked directly to a referent, uh, a body of data which is your body. Biometrics. I was reminded this when I was flying into the country and um, I have one of those British passports which um, has a chip in it and you can go through the machines and be read by it. And, of course, what, what it contains on the chip are measurements. Um, peculiarly, um, I find this very difficult. I find it amazing that people have swallowed this, but uh, they are the same kinds of measurements that the Nazis made of Jews. Measurements of how long the nose is, measurements in between the eyebrows, measurements of the space in between the eyes. And all of this data can be put together, this data photog photograph can be put together in order to correspond to me. Is that an intrinsic part of what a photograph is? I'd say not. I'd say it's metadata. I think Laruelle is trying to get at some idea of a photograph that isn't to do with this. This is something that you can do with a photograph. You can code data into it in order that it becomes a measurement and therefore potentially a political tool. But it's not intrinsic to the flattening, the flat ontology of all photographs. I think here also that um, <coughs> inevitably Laruelle is playing on words, you know, the 2D element of photographs present a sort of flat world. No, these measurements are metadata, and as somebody asked me to talk about metadata in connection with photographs, I will, particularly as it's too, uh, important in terms of understanding the shift from analog to digital. That principle shift is that metadata are coded into photographs themselves, because photographs themselves are now code. All of the stuff that we used to have around photographs Context, headlines, captions, essays may now be contained within. Let me uh, just give you one example of a pre-digital, iconic photograph and the effect of metadata upon the photograph. Um, 
Who's it? Who's talking? You were talking about iconic. Photos. Yeah. 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 There is, I think you'll all agree, an iconic photo of the Vietnam War. And it's a photo of um, a man in profile holding a gun to another man's head. And it's at the moment of the shot. The brains are bursting out of the other side of the man's head. He's been caught at the moment of death. This photo was printed in American newspapers and indeed across the world uh, during the Vietnam War. <laughs> and it acquired a kind of life of its own. Clearly, um, it served a political purpose as propaganda, uh, another affordance possible for a photo during the Vietnam War, in the service of uh, American, uh, the American view of the war. Because what it appeared to demonstrate, given the oriental appearance of these two gentlemen, was the brutality of the Viet Cong. That's all well and good. Except, there's a very nice documentary that came out recently, um, which features Michael Herr, the uh, journalist, Gonzo journalist, who wrote Dispatches, one of the great <coughs> books of uh, the Vietnam War, mm -hmm. and uh, which also features uh, an interview with uh, the photographer who took this photo. And one of the things the photographer says that's interesting is that he didn't know he'd taken the photo. He's a war zone photographer. He did not know what he was doing. He did not know what was going to happen. It happened very suddenly. He could not have predicted it. He happened to be raising his camera at the same time as the shooter happened to raise his gun. And it was one shot, or two shots, combining in the one moment. But over and above that, the story behind the photograph, which is metadata itself, <clears throat> is extremely telling. This was not a Viet Cong shooter. This was an officer, a senior officer, of um, the South Vietnamese army who were working with the Americans. And what he was doing was he was shooting a junior officer who had been convicted of collaboration. In other words, this was um, the result of uh, a wartime military instant decision. One soldier and another soldier, his junior officer, um, the senior officer convicting him and executing him on the spot. Now that's what happens in war. That's what happens if you, uh, if you collaborate with the other side, summary execution. But it's not what we thought the photo was, or indeed what most people still think the photo is when they see it. All this metadata that could have appeared in captions or an essay or indeed in a film about where the photographer tells the story behind it is... Uh, a tremendously important part of what the photograph is, and yet the photograph still is, even without this metadata. So, what I want to come to, uh, to your question of the real, I guess, at this point. Lowell eventually arrives at a point in situating photography somewhere in between uh, art and science, where he starts to seem to me to try and claim photography as, in fact, a part of fiction. Now, this is all well and good. I've heard this uh, argument before, that fiction is the real reality, in fact, is what he's proposing. Harold Bloom a uh, famed Shakespearean scholar and author of the Western canon, um, over the past ten years has started to claim, um, I believe he must be on some strange drugs, but um, he started to claim that uh, Shakespeare's reality is the real reality 
fictional world of Shakespeare is real and we are unreal. Now there's something similar happening with Laruel, except that I take Laruel a little bit more seriously. Why am I going to take him a little bit more seriously? Well, it comes down to this question of the real and representation. Uh, we've had throughout, um, throughout conversations today this idea that um, photography can capture the real, that it can seize on something. We've had the idea of this continuum of the photographed and the technology and the photographer and the image emerging from that. But of course, generally, very few philosophers accept this idea of a, a real world. A real world that is kind of made of objects that are actually there, independent of human perception. We know that something's there, but the way it looks to humans has just as much to do with our own machinery, the machinery of our minds, and the machinery of our eyes and other senses has to do with whatever it is the world is made out of. Here I'd say, of course then, photography does not take the world as the originary and object of its perceptions. This is to make a very false step. Photography is phenomenological. What photography takes as its origin and object is human perception, human vision. That is the thing it simulates, not the world. Or rather, it simulates the world as humans see it. This applies even to, um, even to the most extreme of uh, extreme examples of uh, digital photography. It's still rendering what is seen in a way in which our eyes and our minds can interpret. It is like our vision, and it is not like any other kind of vision. There are, of course, other kinds of photography, for example, x-ray photography, that does not reveal things that we can see. But even they work still on the principle of human vision. They do not interpret outside this narrow phenomenological frame. The question, or a secondary question of today, was then not just what is a photograph, but what does it mean to have a networked photograph? Well, as one conclusion from my previous point, that a photograph does not simulate or imitate or represent the world, but rather it imitates or simulates or represents human vision, a human perception of the world. It follows logically that it is this, the human perception of the world, that is networked when we network photographs. We are networking not events in the world, but perceptual events. I think it's important to make this distinction because otherwise um, what we end up with, and I think we had a little bit of this, uh, this confusion earlier, what, what we end up with when we're using Lowell or, or Deleuze even um, to talk about photography is um, an unfortunate position where we're still talking about the real world and its representation, its copy, and that's idealism. Um, and that's, what we end up there with there is Deleuze saying the same thing as uh, somebody like Roger Scruton, for example, who would make exactly the same point, you know, that what's wrong with photography is that, you know, it's, it's just copying the real world. And I just don't believe that Deleuze and Laruel uh, are so unsubtle. <laughs>
Laurel does make one complicated point for me, and I bring this in because it goes against what I'm saying here. He says that any science, even phenomenology, tries to conflate the essence of a photograph with the content of representation. What does he mean by that? Shall I repeat? Um, any science, even phenomenology, phenomenology, tries to conflate the essence of the photograph with the content of representation. In other words, it tries to conflate the thing being photographed with the photograph itself, the content of the photograph. Or, in yet other words, from the scientific point of view, a photograph is an explanation of something else in a particular language, the language of photography. Again, I would say it's important to remember that what photography is explaining, if it's explaining anything, is not the real world. It's explaining human perception of the real world, but not the real world itself. So basically, Lowell ends up by positing photography as an art of fictions. Scientific photos are equally fictional for him in this regard. And yet the medium is unique enough, evicted from time, as he puts it, but also ignorant of content to become a new language, a new discourse all on its own. I better unpack that a little bit. When Laruel is talking about flattening, that can kind of flat ontology of the photograph, he's saying that intrinsically a photograph is ignorant of the thing it represents, if it represents anything. It's ignorant of content. It, photographs don't care about content. And it's this that enables them to become a kind of language on their own. If photography is this kind of language then that doesn't care about content, although it may be used for the purposes of capturing or representing content in a way in which humans can understand and relate to that content, then um, this is where I feel we were asked to read Peter Sloterdijk bubbles. I could not understand why we were asked to read the slot initially. But this is where I feel it becomes important, at least in my interpretation, and it's very nice to understand what slot might have to tell us about modern photography. <coughs> what slot has been trying to do over the past 15 or 20 years, and uh, for those of you who don't know slot he's, um, he's he's like the... Um, Bernard Henri Levy of, of Germany. He's um, he's a, a TV TV philosopher. He's also a very respected philosopher um, at uh, the Karlsruhe <coughs> Institute of Technology. Um, but he is nonetheless one of those philosophers who manages to get himself a TV talk show and sit around with uh, a bunch of people late at night. There is a market for this shit on the continent, by the way. Oh, that's great. Um, uh, There's a the future for us. Philosophers <laughs> sitting around the table late at night discussing stuff and stroking their beard. Um, but Sloterdijk has also been very politically active. And one of the things that Sloterdijk is interested in at the moment is opposing the cult of individualism, which he sees as the curse of the West. Um, he is also a very controversial philosopher in China. <coughs> He's interested in opposing the cult of individualism because he feels that um, perhaps Germany has lost sight of what it means to be collective to work together, to pull together 
and indeed, of course, until recently, perhaps until um, the World Cup, when the World Cup was held in Germany, it was very difficult for Germans to pull together. Um, it's true. Yeah. You couldn't uh, really kind of identify clearly as German. Uh, you certainly couldn't kind of, you know, you wouldn't wear a German shirt or display the German flag. Germany was a very fragmented nation, uh, and also a very Americanized nation, of course, following the war. Following that cult of individualism, and Slotterdow wanted to try and kind of rescue Germany from this fragmentation into individualism. So, why bring Slotterdijk in here? Well, at the beginning of Bubbles, what Slotterdijk says is that um, he tells this story of uh, Plato having a sign of the arch saying, um, uh, you can't enter into my school unless you're a geometer, unless you know geometry. And he says, yeah, this is fine. This is a good thing. I would say that anybody who wants to be a philosopher, yes, ought to know their geometry. Thing is, there's a certain geometry in photography that everybody seems to be able to identify with. A certain fundamental geometricism, both in the act of photographing and in the compositional element, but also in the creation of a photo itself. And then a photo is fundamentally uh, conventionally that, a geometrical object. And this geometry, it is, which enables us to have the networked photo, the photo that exists between all of us. Here then I'd like to propose um, No, here I no. Well, I'll come to it. But here I'd like to tell a very short story and then propose one thing. I'd like to go back to um, some time before, uh, long before the invention of photography, uh, and to what um, we might describe as the invention of uh, modern science, or at least modern knowing. Um, I'd like to go back to Denis Diderot, uh, the great. Um, encyclopédiste, figurehead of the Enlightenment, and uh, philosopher. And Diderot wrote a book called um, Letter on the Blind, for the benefit of those who can see. And in it, it's, by the way, I'll let, I'll let you into the story, the secret of the story first. It, he made it up. It's not true. But in it, he pretends that it's true, that um, he took a blind man, uh, the blind man of Puiseux, and he told this blind man that he had this wonderful new machine, a wonderful new machine which simulates reality right down to every little last detail. And he described the machine to the blind man in all its details and capacities. And then he said to the blind man, and now I'm going to show you the machine. And he took the blind man and he placed him in front of the mirror. And the blind man explores the mirror. He stretches out his hands, of course, and discovers a flat surface. And then the blind man gets to voice his objections to... Uh, Diderot's machine, and he says, well, it's not a very effective machine, is it? It's a bit rubbish. I'd expected something that would render in relief. And yet, all we've got here is this flat surface, this nothingness. It doesn't do anything. <coughs> There's something about this flattening that Laruelle is talking about in relation to photography, that brings that to my mind. That tells me what's good about photography and what's bad about it at the same time. 
I'm not sure that I can summarize what's good or what's bad. But just to conclude, I'll say that this division between the blind man and Diderot and his wonderful new machine is a, a division that we're seeing throughout society, enabled by a technology or uh, a piece of technological apparatus, which is vulnerable to scientific appropriations for the purposes of measurement and therefore of discipline, but is also vulnerable to artistic appropriation for the purposes of whatever art wants to use it for. And I'd like to end by addressing a, a kind of social pull that exists with the networked image, the networked photograph, and I'd like to address this through J.G. Ballard. J.G. Ballard, as uh, many of you know, um, was fascinated by what he called the non-spaces of, uh, of Western society, motorway underpasses, airport corridors, these unrecorded blank spaces in between everything else, um, where we tend to spend most of our lives. And he identified these non-spaces with a kind of quintessential Western modern experience of alienation. But he thought that modern technologies such as photography and video, and particularly when the internet came along, the sharing possibilities embodied in the internet would enable us uh, to become more together, to find a new kind of togetherness. And in a 1974 interview with Carol Orr, he said, um, of course, all of these technologies will bring us together, but not in a way that you're going to like. Because at the moment, people in the West are terribly alone. <coughs> They're terribly alienated. They might as well be living on a desert island. And Carol also, well, I don't feel like I'm living on a desert island. I think she lives in Toronto. <laughs> she just couldn't see, you know, I live in the middle of a very busy city. What do you mean I'm alone? Here's, here's the paradox. The very technologies that are enabling this new togetherness are also uh, facilitating a terrible separateness, a terrible alienation, a modern condition of um, togetherness which is not togetherness. And the networked photograph, I feel, is right at the heart of this. And I just want to leave it there, really on a social question rather than a philosophical question. I have a feeling it might be a little bit more approachable. Thanks. Thanks. Um, questions? <clears throat> yeah, Daniel. Well, thank you very much. Specifically, thank you for reminding us about the letter to the blind. I think yeah. that's really appropriate. Um, well, I have it's, a couple of points. There is, there is an, is there an, oh, is there an English translation? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. Um, right. But uh, a couple of points I wanted to raise. First, you started by uh, alerting us to the dangers of essentialism. Uh, but then you seem to suggest that photography is exhausted by uh, the phenomenology of vision, which suggests that it is still an essentialist approach to photography. Um, so but that made me think about something that um, Deleuze wrote when I was very young, I was about 25, and it was a postscript, I think, to a book by uh, Justitia Hippolyte. I don't know if you're familiar to it with that. It's, uh, it's in Hippolyte's book, uh, Logic of... Uh, it's in Hippolyte's book on Hegel. And Deleuze wrote a, a postscript in which he says, um, I think it starts from a very kind of famous sentence, says, philosophy uh, must be an ontology. It cannot be anything else. However, it must be an ontology of sense, not of essence. And I would be tempted to say that the same thing is holds true for photography. Uh, the ontology of photography must be an ontology of sense, not of essence.
So therefore, we cannot go to vision. But we need to go to the repetition, which is inherent in photography, and draw its um, essential essence out of it. And then it's not a question of what we can see, but what can be reproduced, and how the rhythm of reproduction itself creates difference, and difference creates sense. So then in that way, we we leave the blind man with his mirror, and we have a different dimension, which I agree has something to do with the network, where meaning has absolutely nothing to do with the human inclination to convert objects or things into pictures. The meaning then is derived out of a certain rhythm. Yeah. There are two there are two questions there. One a really very different is when you come to start to use the word meaning, um, that I start to have problems because I isn't it fair to say that if we do approach photography as a sort of explanation of something else, then it's an epistemological thing. But that is not going to answer any ontological question we have about what a photograph is. Because I don't think it's possible to ask the ontological question about one thing alone. To ask an ontological question, um, for those of you who don't know what an ontological question is, um, a, a question about the nature of being. To ask an ontological question necessitates um, an entire ontology in which all things are accounted for. It has to be a complete explanation of everything, including the epistemologies that are possible within an ontology. And so I, I think there's, a, a, or I, I just react when you come up to the question of meaning with a big alarm bell at the back of my head saying, well, well, hang on a minute, there's a danger of mixing two. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's a problem with the language. <laughs> yeah, and also, in, even when one talks about ontology, it doesn't necessarily, in a metaphysic sense, it, doesn't, it would obviously be about being. But if you think of ontology as a type of surface as opposed to as a ground, it's not going to be speaking about the, uh, and the, the rise of being. It's going to be talking about how something cohesive ends up making sense. And that's a very different form of ontology that's going on, which I think is what L'Oreal's getting at amongst other people. But yeah, I can, I can see that. Not, not, to, yeah. not to, for me, I don't want to take over the thing, but yeah, go ahead, Matthias. Well, probably I was going to do the same comment. Um, you didn't speak that before. Uh, I was probably attempting the same comment. Um, the, on this issue of ontology and requiring a to, a total or totalitarian uh, movement that encompasses everything, um, you spoke earlier about, and I think it's absolutely right, that photography simulates the sense of sight, or vision, rather than simulating reality, which made me think of. Uh, somehow a very mm, uh, general Kantian move of thinking. We, we reach phenomena, never the reality itself. Um, and it would work very well to describe photography. But when <coughs> the issue of an ontology of it is raised, um, whether it is a metaphysical ontology that, that needs a total and totally exhaustive description or definition, or, or at least ontology as a unique, ontology is always singular. <coughs> Even if it, is, if it is a metaphysic, there is always only one ontology that it cannot be applied plurally. Mm -hmm. uh, while there can be different ways of behaving, different performances, different manifestations, which are a series or articulations that span from an aesthetic on one end and an epistemology at the other, not as pre existing poles, but as the two tensions that constantly coexist in, uh, in, in, a, in a sense that happens. In this way, I think Daniel meant meaning. It, somehow, meaning as the result of a process that 
is functional in, in a feedback loop logic to the process itself. Um, Meaning in the sense of the eternal return. As well. Yeah. But when, mm -hmm. when earlier in your presentation you spoke of um, photography as images that have that refers to, to other images, previous images, I thought of uh, genealogies of the images. But as an artist, I think much more when I deal with anything, not only photography, about what has been done before, and what has been done by people I like, don't like, examples, history, um, examples of positive, negative, and then I react to those. I don't constantly go back to an origin or a ground. So there, there is that element of which pattern is repeating itself, what is in place, and how I can engage with that. I think that it would help a lot in, in articulating this distinction between meaning and ontology and the problem we were, we were bringing up there. <laughs> okay, so let's, let, let me ask a question then, um, a, a Nietzschean question about photography. Um, what would it mean to have a photograph of nothing? What would a photograph of nothing be? It's two different, it's, different things. Then. I know there are. <laughs> <laughs> well, the answer is that every photograph is a photograph. Even Michael says a very famous piece called A Photograph of Nothing, in which there's a piece of photographic paper put through the processor, fantastically done, and handwritten of the attempt to photograph reality. And it's a description of something that was in front of the camera that you couldn't actually make happen. So it's really quite an interesting piece because there is nothing descriptive, there's no content based. Relies on the viewer putting in place something he saw but couldn't photograph. So it's a quite interesting piece. I think, you know, apropos of that as well, and, and in answer to Dan's um, very provocative, um, double headed question. Um, and I have said this jokingly throughout the conference, but I do think that one has to think very seriously about what it is to talk about the God particle and the Higgs boson. And that is literally the attempt to show how a something is existing in the nothing, as it were. Um, and so while you're right, Daniel, to, or given the argument you're presenting, it makes perfect sense to say that, the, that a photograph is in fact nothing, as it were. I think what you're also suggesting is that how do you actually get a something that emerges at the moment of its nothingness, without trying to sound completely like over the, head, over the top here. And, I, and at the moment, the, the, one of the ways into that has been through physics, has been through very specific kind of physics around uh, finding this thing called the God particle, which is a longer conversation. But I wanted to ra keep raising it, uh, throwing it out so that people hear it, so that there's a way in which one, you know, someone like Adorno thinks of uh, uh, negation in terms of d uh, dialectical negation, and that's how he's talking about a surface, and the surface can be uh, inhabited, as it were, but the surface is never part of the foundation, but on the other hand, it's not not part of the foundation, and so on and so forth. And then you get to Einstein, and the surface is, in fact, the uh, cohesiveness of the, of the E and the MC squared, and the way it sticks together, and that forms the surface, and so on. So we're getting you know, different ways in on this question of the surface being a something, except it isn't, or the other way around. There's a nothing, except it's not just nothing, uh, so on and so forth. So, so I think that the way in which you're presenting this as human perception, I think is quite interesting. This way in which, rather than to put the perception in the old and <laughs> usual ways of perception related to vision, it becomes this networked entity, energy, actually, that has a something to it. That's what I heard you more or less provocatively presenting, but maybe I've just made that up. Uh, that's, what I'm, that's one of the things I'm trying to say. Yeah, I I'm, it's quite, I'm also quite phenomenal. I mean, quite interesting, it's not phenomenal. <laughs> <laughs> Best joke of the day. Um, <laughs> Hannah, Hannah's going to have the last one. I have a reservation about um, emerging from our work um, about the analogy side of things. Because um, I think that it's really important to think to an extent he does make that analogy, to an extent he also rejects it. Yeah. Because if we talk about human perception and you're presupposing a certain kind of subjectivity, 
this idea of the stance and sort of like the vision of course. It's like this instance of finitude, some kind of like distancing, some kind of you know, so he's basically he's thinking about the golf past in the sense he's trying to be staged this autophotical yeah, beginning of, 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 of philosophy that he sees in but at the same time he wants to talk about body radically without organs, he says, and this idea of what it does is, I think it's something almost new today actually, he's, um, he talks about passivity and he talks about force, vision is force, so not to think about maybe the, the, the capturing, it's not like an analogy of the size and apparatus, but something that there is prior to that, some kind of um, <coughs> yeah, and it's prior, not the, not the Kantian sense, like an a priori or synthetic unity. It's prior in this inventness of the self. Um, if I, we're heading toward three minutes to six, and a lot of people have to race off to catch a um, train and so on and so forth. May I take this moment to thank everybody and to say that this can be continued in the pub? Um, but also to say that this was, I think, a very rich... Uh, discussion, uh, energy field um, on rethinking, restaging, re-inhabiting, or just anyway dealing with the photograph in, in many different ways. And it's the um, continuation of this whole project. We'll have a second uh, workshop. Uh, these are called international conversations. So we'll have our second international conversation in uh, March 8th, I think it is, in London. Um, and you all will be invited because we're, we're building on this whole project. Um, and then there will be the major conference at the other bookend I mentioned at the outset, which will happen here uh, at the end of May. I think it's the 26th to the 29th um, here in uh, CIFAR. And in the meantime, those of you that feel that this is a home for you in some ways, at least uh, via the Internet, uh, please uh, let us have your details so you can become uh, a research fellow or an international research fellow if you're not part of BIAD. Uh, so that we continue this conversation. I think that this is the idea here. We're just going to do something very different. And I want to thank everybody for coming and participating. Thanks. Can I, can yeah. I just... I actually forgot one final provocation. I had a short film to show you. It's a minute. It's one minute long. Okay. Will anybody tolerate that? Tolerate it. And then okay. I can make my speech again. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Sorry, this is one the, the short film kind of um, is an art project by an artist called Sasha Poflet, uh, and it kind of brings together so many of the issues that I was trying to raise here. Uh, it is specifically about the networked camera, so, and it's also available as an iPhone app. Okay, hit it, Luke. King of Dodo means making memories, choosing a moment in time and creating a situation. Dodo for many. Making their moments public is already part of the process of photography itself. Buttons takes on this notion of the camera as a network object. It is a camera that will capture a moment at the press of a button. However, unlike a conventional analog or digital camera, this one doesn't have any optical elements. It allows you to capture your moment, but in doing so, it effectively separates itself from the subject. Instead, as you will memorize the moment, the camera memorizes only the time and starts to continuously search in the net for other photos that have been taken in the very same moment. Essentially, it is a camera that, using a mobile communication device, takes other photos. After a few minutes or hours, a photo will appear on the screen. No matter how enigmatic, the photos are never dismissed as random, since in a way they belong half to the person who pressed the button in the first place. Thank you all very much.